Hello. Welcome to Artist and Critic. I'm Don Gray. With us today is the distinguished writer and art critic for the New York Times, Mr. John Canaday. Mr. Canaday is the author of such uh, well-known books as Mainstreams of Modern Art, one of the outstanding histories of the modern art period, as well as more personal uh, works, The Embattled Critic and Culture Gulch. And as you know, he's also the author of the seminars for the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Thanks for coming, Mr. Kennedy. Uh, what, what is it in, your, in the position that you have taken as a critic that makes you embattled? Um, well, I think I have run a little bit against the general current of criticism in that I have been unwilling to accept everything that was new as something valuable just because it was new. Actually, I know that I'm considered to be an extremely conservative critic, but if you counted up my reviews and of individual painters and tallied the score, I think you'd find that I had done as many sympathetic reviews for what they call uh, very advanced or experimental painters as I had done unsympathetic ones. I like uh, I like painting and sculpture when it's good, <laughs> quite, <laughs> quite devoid of, of what style it's in. Actually, I had a debate once with Thomas Hess, another critic, uh, and uh, he said, well, what are you for? What are you for? Of course, Tom Hess was very, very much for abstract expressionism. Right, I remember that. Still is. With Art News, particularly. Yes, as that is yes. Vehicle. He said, what are you for? And I said, well, I don't know. I, uh, I, guess I'm, I guess I'm for good painting. And he said, oh, nonsense. Anybody can be for good painting. Uh, well, I had an answer to that one, of course. I said, then why aren't you? But, <laughs> but I, didn't think, of it. <laughs> I didn't think of it until two weeks later in the shower, so it, <laughs> it didn't do me much good. But uh, I think, I think that's, that's my stand, uh, that uh, I don't. I don't adopt a single line, which rather confuses people. Some of the galleries uh, used to say they never knew how I was going to respond to a show, which I think is a uh, rather favorable comment, yeah, exactly. actually. Exactly. Well, why do you feel that there have been so few critics uh, with this criteria of good art? It seems that so many will simply applaud what has come along, what is new, uh, or simply make a bland statement that, neither, that says nothing without having the content that m much of your reviewing ha has? Um, I, well, I've never wondered about that. But I think it, it is because... Um, is it like it's a, it's a family almost, sort of, that becomes somewhat ingrown? And the, uh, perhaps. I think perhaps uh, it is because I came rather late into the, into the criticism game. I, I taught school for a long, long time in the taught the history of art at various universities for a long time. Then I was with Philadelphia Museum and uh, began writing art criticism in the newspaper after, uh, after a long experience in the history of art. Whereas I think many critics come to the game much younger and they come at a time when they're all enthusiastic about some particular development. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's good because it gives the writing a, a lot of vigor. And uh, they believe in something, they express themselves enthusiastically, the way Tom Hess did and so forth. I think that uh, the only reason I was different was that I'd been around long enough to have seen so many things come and go right. that uh, I tended to be a little cautious about saying the latest thing was uh, the best thing always. Would you, say, like that. would you say that the last 25 years uh, uh, has been one of excessive fashion consciousness in the arts, that, that there has been much frivolity, and, and it seems that it has uh, uh, just been one thing with increasing speed developing each year something new happens, and then it dies and something else comes, and perhaps the general level hasn't been that high. What, what is your feeling about that? I think things have, uh, have changed a little too rapidly, and certainly during... Uh, during the last 10 or 15 years, as uh, most, I think most critics would agree, there has been a tendency on the part of artists to uh, 
sort of look at the history of art and, and see what's coming next and, uh, and then try for it. For instance, uh, you look back on the history of art, you can see that uh, out of Impressionism, Cezanne came very naturally. Yes. And out of Cezanne, Cubism came yes. very naturally. And out of Cubism, uh, let's say hard edge abstraction came very naturally. Well, and after hard edge abstraction, what? Well, somebody decided <laughs> maybe minimum art, minimal art, which, uh, and, uh, which tried to reduce um, art to, well, sculpture, for instance. Tony Smith's famous yeah. six-foot black cube was the ultimate sculpture. Well, it did seem that, uh, by its very name, minimal art couldn't be reduced. But then we had uh, conceptual art, which said, <laughs> let's, no, let's even do, a, do away with even that cube, do away the art entirely, and uh, just mm -hmm. let the brain of the artist communicate with the brain of the observer in whatever funny way it might do. I think there has been that tendency on the part of artists to say what, what's going to be new and to be prophetic. And have they gotten themselves into a blind alley because of this? Well, would you say that really Cezanne's art, as it has been interpreted by 20th century artists, led to a blind alley? I'm not imp, 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 uh, imp, I don't imputing think Cezanne or, at all, no. but... Uh, I don't think there is any such thing as art ever hitting a blind alley because art is something that uh, is going to happen in spite of everything, including in spite of artists and in spite of critics. And as far as it's being in a blind alley right now, certainly not. I traced one uh, rather simplistic, uh, one series of events from Impressionism to uh, conceptual art. Right. But all you have to do right now is look around. I think the situation is extremely healthy in the galleries because there's everything at once. Uh, pop art was, of course, a big anti-abstract revolution, and uh, now we've got every form of realism is tolerated, every form of abstraction is tolerated. When I first came to New York, it was virtually impossible for a young artist to get a, a first show in a gallery unless he was right in the abstract expressionist line. Mm -hmm. Well, that flourished until it overflourished. <laughs> and uh, various things took its place. But right now, I really think that the quality of a work of art is allowed to tell independently of movements in a way that it hasn't for many, many years. I like the way it is right now. Do you see a resurgence? Uh, you've mentioned realism and so forth, and that has been sort of anathema for many, many moons now. Do you see a resurgence of a significant realism? Oh, sure. Absolutely. Uh, beginning with pop art and, uh, well, and all the photorealism and uh, all of this, which is a uh, rather obvious overreaction. But at the same time, there's a, there's a great deal of just plain good, realistic, uh, individualistic painting. The idea that uh, realism has to be old-fashioned, per se, of course, is uh, ridiculous. Right. But it has been a, a damned uh, word and a damned uh, term as far as everybody thinks of it as going back. And it seems as in this day and age, that's the one thing we can't even think of, you know, going back or uh, it has to, everything has to be new. And it seems no. that we've been caught in that trap so much. Do you, do you feel that way or? Well, I, they, what finally happened was that realism itself was something new. <laughs> it hadn't been practiced or tolerated for so long. Oh no, I think that within the last, uh, three years, the resurgence of uh, realism is the closest thing there has been to an avant-garde art. Everybody admits the term avant-garde means nothing anymore because all art is avant-garde, which makes none of it so. Oh, but uh, realism is it right now. In a strange way, the, didn't the term, if it was used, it became almost twisted in a sense so that the avant-garde, would you say, became almost the establishment in a sense oh, yeah. in that it dominated the art, art scene and the art sure. world. And there are a couple of uh, quotes here in, uh, in the appendix of Sophie Burnham's uh, book, The Art Crowd, uh, in which Mr. Canaday discusses uh, abstract expressionism and, and some of the uh, work at, the, at that time. Uh, for example, on September 6, 1959, Mr. Canaday wrote, 
But as for, the, and this may be out of context, we'll have Mr. Kennedy uh, comment on it. But as for the freaks, the charlatans, and the misled who surround this handful of serious and talented artists, let us at least admit that the nature of abstract expressionism allows except, exceptional tolerance for incompetence and deception. And then you I'm glad this wasn't prearranged. No, no. I'm glad you read that particular oh, really? passage because it included one word there, the word tolerance, that was misunderstood and led to many of the, uh, I think, uh, inspired the attacks on me at that time. I said that the nature of abstract expressionism allowed for exceptional tolerance for these, uh, for incompetence or right. whatever I said. Right. That. But you see, I was using uh, the way the abstract expressionist people interpreted that was that they, the critics who were in favor of it and the artists who uh, practice it, that they tolerated uh, incompetence and the phonies and so forth. I didn't mean that at all. I used, was using the word tolerance in the way it is used in uh, of machine parts. You know, the, the tolerance of a, of a uh, piston into, uh, into the whatever cylinder it is, the whatever. cylinder, all that right. business. Right. There is a degree of tolerance that, which may be large or small. I meant that by its very nature, there was an area in which abstract expressionism, more than most yeah. styles, did allow for this tolerance. Simply because it was a, it was one of the first styles of painting in which uh, technical control in the conventional sense was in no way important. Anybody could, could learn the technique of abstract expressionism. It did not mean that uh, the conception of a good abstract expressionist work of art was any easier just because the technique was easier. But that was what I meant by the tolerance. And I don't think people interpreted that word correctly. Yeah, maybe they didn't. I, as you say, they, just sure, wasn't, got, they sure got mad. Yeah, <laughs> uh, it, this uh, statement was uh, from a listing of several of Mr. Kennedy's positions in the late 1959 and the early 60s. Uh, a letter to the Times uh, signed by a score or more uh, artists signed and educators. By, and Signed by 49 people as it came what, out. It was, was originally signed by 50 people, but uh, one of the people turned out to be a curator at the Museum of Modern Art, and at the last minute they made him yank his name off. What, for fear that, that well, it was the, getting uh, too politically involved yes, or something in that sense, yes. I guess? So yeah. it turned out to be 49. There's some mighty big names on that list, too. Yeah, we, there really were. Do we care to mention any of them? There, well, I'd like to mention, uh, I would like to mention one of them. No, Stuart Davis, yes. who was alive at that time. Well, yes. now, Stuart Davis is it was quite a name. He was quite a painter. Exactly. As a matter of fact, in, in my book that you referred to, Mainstreams of Modern Art, I treated him very sympathetically as, right. an, as an important American artist, etc. So there were only two names on that list that I couldn't understand. One of them was de Kooning, because I also had been oh, quite a de Kooning fan. You have supported and, de Kooning? I oh, yes. Very and uh, had at that time. Mm -hmm. Well, I wrote him and I wrote Stuart Davis, the same letter that uh, I just didn't know why they signed it, because certainly my position was uh, not just a matter of because I'd been good to them, that mm -hmm. they might have uh, held out personally, but because what I'd written about their work should have indicated that I that I knew something. You understood it and responded yes. to it? Yes. Well, de Kooning apparently never answered his letter. I didn't get an answer from him. Right but I did get a letter from Stuart Davis, which I gave to the Archives of American Art. And it says, uh, I've never read anything you've written. Now, he signed this letter about uh, how awful I was and so on. He said, I have never read anything you've written. He said, my friends say you're anti-modern, so I signed the letter. He didn't oh. apologize for it. Oh dear! Um, <laughs> but to say that, the least, uh, an apology that hurt, was that hurt a little bit. Yeah. The rest I could yeah. understand. They, they were some of them were hit where it hurts mm -hmm. in the pocketbook. Mm -hmm. Some were genuinely offended aesthetically. Others just enjoyed a good fight. Uh, it was rather painful in a way that letter, and yet it was. Yeah. It wasn't all bad. It brought me a great deal of attention. Well, you've, it, it seems that uh, the one thing I'm struck with by your criticism uh, is that it, it seems that it always does stem from a great honesty of position and uh, 
you're not afraid to say your mind and what you think, and uh, I'm wondering why so few art critics do this. And one thing that crossed my mind is, why is art criticism so different from that of drama or film, or maybe even the dance, although I'm not that familiar with it, where they just come right out and say, what's right is, what's good is good, what's bad is bad. A play will close overnight because the critic says, this is a piece of garbage. Well, why, why don't we say this in art? Why aren't we more honest and well, direct uh, as, uh, as you've been, among few, really? I can't think of too many people that... Well, I think the... Uh, I don't think you really can say that uh, there's an, any great uh, dishonesty or, or deception among the major critics. They, uh, they do say what they like and they do say what they don't like. But uh, it's simply that primarily most, have, most of them have a, a much more uh, limited enthusiasm. They think that I have no position, but well, we've all been into that. Right. I have the position that I like good Quality. art. Yeah. Uh, and then I think also that many times when a critic has uh, come out all, uh, come out all the way for one particular movement, it's a little embarrassing for him oh, to man. fall back which explains a lot. As far as the difference between art critics and the drama critics and all of that is concerned, uh, the drama and the movies are not split up into different stylistic factions so much. You can, all right, you can say, I like uh, Ingmar Bergman, mm -hmm. or I like one of the popular directors, whoever they are, better than this. They, they, there's a certain degree of that, but it's not, not quite the same. Another uh, reason, I think, that critics are not quite as powerful in uh, the way a Broadway, mm. a drama critic can bankrupt mm. a Broadway show with a bad review. You give a bad review to an art exhibition, people are very interested. <laughs> it's a lot of fun sometimes to write bad reviews. It's much easier than to mm. explain mm. What, what what's good. good <laughs> yes. But you see, it doesn't cost them to go anything, uh, it doesn't cost them anything to go to the art exhibition. They go and see for themselves. Whereas, after a bad review, uh, they don't want to put out $15 for a theater ticket. That's a great advantage. And one thing that I have, have liked about my, my position and what influence I can have is that I could absolutely fill a gallery with a, an enthusiastic review. It happens that much. Yes, and I like that. Well, as I say, it doesn't cost anything, and you know, it's toned down some, but for a while there, everybody was just milling up and down Madison Avenue every Saturday afternoon. Checking it was, it out. <laughs> <laughs> but what I like about that was not that I can fill a gallery. That's flattering, of course. It means people read you, and they're interested in what you write. Right. But what I liked was that sometimes I would give an enthusiastic review, and the show would sell out. It would sell out. And sometimes I would give an enthusiastic review and it wouldn't sell at all, which meant that people were interested in comparing my reaction to theirs perhaps, but in the end they were making up Made their, own, their own, own judgments. I don't, think, uh, I don't think many pictures have been sold just because I said that, uh, that they were, uh, there are a couple of critics, Clement Greenberg I think, has been such a prophet of uh, new movements that people have bought painters he likes, painters and sculptors, just because they think that uh, it's going to be a good investment by now, like a, you know, like buying Xerox early or something, yeah, exactly. and uh, sell later. That, as far as I'm concerned, has nothing to do with, uh, with art, and it's uh, something I always resent, buying art as an investment. Yeah, I have too. I suppose it's an unrealistic uh, position to <laughs> to take in a world of uh, finance and economic necessity and so forth, but uh, that, that's sort of what I wanted to ask. Uh, first of all, I, I didn't want to imply that art critics are deceptive or dishonest. Uh, I just have come to realize there's a tremendous difference in the way they approach their craft or art and the way the uh, other, other critics do. But do you feel that uh, financial considerations are unnecessarily dominant, dominant in our time in terms of what is exhibited, who collects what, and, and so forth? I think that uh, the dealers, as salesmen, have had uh, rather too strong an influence on the direction art has taken. 
a dealer uh, who has a who has the know-how, a dealer who is a great salesman, can virtually create an art movement. Or if he doesn't, he can see one developing and then perhaps overstimulate, uh, overstimulate it. You know, Alfred Barr always hated the idea that the Museum of Modern Art was a tastemaker. He said, the artists lead, we follow. Uh, but the artists, the artists may lead a little bit, but <laughs> our com our uh, whole system is so complicated, and it is we are we are a commercial civilization after all. Yeah. Uh, the the artists who wouldn't get anywhere uh, leading down in a Soho loft or in a Greenwich Village basement or wherever he was. He's got to have somebody to push him, mm -hmm. and a clever dealer can uh, sort of overfeed a movement. I think. Are there any recent movements that you feel were overfed? Uh, yes, I think pop art was overfed, and I'm sorry about that because I think that pop was really one of the uh, pop was the most significant movement since abstract expressionism, as far as I'm concerned, and it had a great potential, which I think was partially sacrificed by uh, being overfed. But out of it has come all of this uh, this uh, new realistic business. What, what what do you think was the value of pop art? What were they trying to pop express? Art? Do you think? Uh, it seems like there's so many attitudes as to what... Well, pop art was, of course, ostentatiously vulgar and uh, sort of anti-cultural. But what I liked about pop art was that uh, it brought art back to, you know, it's a terrible phrase, contact with life. But it no, did. I, I like that phrase. <laughs> I think it's so important. Uh, I think it's terribly important for, for art to appeal to something more than uh, cerebral aesthetics. Mm -hmm. It's very funny you look back at abstract expressionism now and everybody understands it well enough to know that it was essentially an emotional expression, mm -hmm. whereas it was passed as cerebral for quite a while. But what I liked about Pop was it was dealing in recognizable images again. It was speaking very directly in terms that people could understand. Sometimes the, ter the terms were shocking. And uh, frequently they were, well, they were almost always overplayed, terrible exaggeration. But nevertheless, there was, uh, our society was being commented on mm -hmm. once more. And uh, we were, we were given uh, visual clues that uh, abstract art doesn't supply to people in general. That's the reason I liked it. That's sort of what I was mentioning when we were talking earlier about blind alleys. It, it seemed almost as if, abstraction by its very nature led to a blind alley where mankind, and all these big words again, yeah. and the artists lost contact not only with themselves and their own emotions and their soul, if we want to throw these words around, some of the deeper issues and connection with life that all the greats in the past had. You know, so that in, in that sense it almost seems as if we're involved in some kind of a renaissance or rebirth of art trying. It's, and I think it's the most difficult thing perhaps uh, to make a connection to express some of the profundity of reality again in that sense. Uh, one, one more question about pop art. I was always wondered about its form. It, it always seemed as if its form was taken from magazine illustration and was so two-dimensional that it wasn't really concerned truly with painterly form. Would, did, did you ever feel that way about it? Or? No, no, it never was very painterly, it's true. But <clears throat> uh, because it was dealing with the with the vulgarities of life around us, I think it's quite appropriate that it should uh, turn for its uh, stylistic manner mm -hmm. to, the, to the most commonplace, to the, to the vulgar expressions. I'm using vulgar here more in the expression of uh, meaning of the people Every day. than of uh, you know, vulgarity as something offensive, right. although it was frequently that also. <laughs> Floppy toilets no, and, and yeah. so forth. No, it was not. Uh, <clears throat> It was never an elegant art. Uh, we have one more minute, Mr. Candy. There's one question I have to ask. Uh, uh, Ermgard Woldering, in his book, Man, Gods, and Pharaohs, uh, concerning the art of Egypt, said that though the men of the late period are sufficiently alert intellectually to realize their world is threatened, uh, they lack the creative energy to do anything about it. D do you feel that at any time in post-World War art that uh, American art has been in that position? I would say uh, 
quite the reverse. Quite the reverse. Yes, I'm not <laughs> sure that, uh, that I would string along with the statement in the first place, but if the statement, uh, statement is true, I'd say that American art had a kind of a boiling variety, that uh, it's got an energy. Whatever is wrong with it, it's got tremendous energy. And it uh, seems to me that it's, it's a very optimistic symptom that we're okay. So you feel <laughs> that the, the art being produced today in the last 25 years uh, signals that we're in good shape, uh, society and artistically, societally? Or it doesn't re reflect society? We're getting into something here. <laughs> time's running yes. out. Well, actually, <clears throat> I mean, it's such a big question, I couldn't answer it. But, right. uh, but I think that uh, what we're all about, for good or for ill, has been pretty well expressed in the art of the last 25 mm -hmm. years mm -hmm. right. in America. Thanks very much. We've been speaking with uh, John Kennedy, writer, art critic uh, for the New York Times and author of many, many books, including the excellent Mainstreams of Modern Art and uh, the Embattled Critic, Culture Gulch, and the Metropolitan Seminars on Art. Thanks for watching Artist and Critic. I'm Don Gray. Have a good day.